Welcome to another episode of the Space Salvi Institute podcast. I'm Andrew Pettiprin with Bobby Mixa. Bobby, how are you? Good, Andrew. I'm extremely excited about this uh, conversation today because uh, now I have somebody here to explain why I find Croc so beautiful. So looking forward yeah. to getting into this. Well, maybe he can help explain why I find Dallas, Texas, maybe not as beautiful, uh, but uh, we shall see. Uh, yeah, we are excited because our guest today is uh, is doing work that we we've we've recently discovered and uh, is very much in line with uh, with our goals and our our project with our institute. And our guest name is Michael Diamant, and he is the founder of New Traditional Architecture. He's an urban sociologist with a great interest in architecture, city planning, demography, history, and social anthropology. He's based in Sweden. He has a really terrific website that has all kinds of information on it that we know our listeners and viewers are going to want to know more about. But anyway, let's get into it. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I, I'm, as I told you, I'm so delighted to be able to, to reach an even wider audience, you know, with this positive message that, you know, our future can look very different from what, from what you know, what we are, what we are told all the time. You know, every time you see some kind of, a movie that depicts the future it always looked like dystopia you know mm. strange high rises and smog is that what we want for the future mm. no i don't think so you know everyone dreams of some kind of pittoresque italian village i think you know that's the, where, where we want to li to live so why can't we have that yeah a absolutely this is sometimes bobby and i have had this this same conversation among ourselves and we you know, you share it with a few other people and they sort of think it's quaint or, you know, oh, that's that's a nice idea or something, you know, but I mean, we we really mean it. We really mean it. We want to live in a beautiful world and there's no reason we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the world used to be beautiful. OK, we can talk about, you know, socialists. There were many. So there are many socialists today and there will always be social ills and there were socialists in the past. But generally, there was a culture where everything was beautiful. And not only buildings, the city planning was beautiful. Uh, staircases were beautiful. Elevators were beautiful. Uh, road ramps were beautiful. Everything was made beautiful and, in, you know, with thought and consideration. So it was a very, very different culture. But then something happened. You know, the, the seeds of this mental destruction, you know, began in the, you know, before World War II, but then they hijacked, you know, like many other things in society and culture, they hijacked the architecture institutions. It was like, um, I forgot what the, what the name of this bird is in English, but you have this bird that lays eggs in other birds' nests. And when that, what you call it, cuckoo bird or something, you know, this, uh, it, it lays eggs there and, you know, that, when that hatches, it pushes away the original eggs, and then it, you know, it takes over everything. As that's very much what happened, you know, in all our our architecture schools. The modernists that came, they were accepted as equals, and then they took over the institutions. And then once they were in power, they haven't allowed, they haven't let grip of that power, so they haven't let any, any you know, different thoughts. Uh, allowed at our architecture schools. Mm -hmm. So the only way, the only things that people are taught today in architecture schools is this ideology of modernism, that the future has to look in a certain way and you are forbidden to look back, you know, mm -hmm. the past, you know, mm -hmm. to learn from 2,000 years of experience how to create beautiful places. Yeah. Let's um let's let's take that thought and develop it in the real world example that we that the that we uh, many of us are thinking about right now which is the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris which you know there was a horrific fire there in in 2019 I Bobby and I have talked about this I mean when that happened I couldn't have imagined a worse thing to see with my eyes than that building that beautiful building uh, on fire. But here we are five years later, and there's a restoration and rebuilding process well underway with a, a, a target of reopening later in the year. Uh, you recently did an interview with our friend Billy Newton, William Newton, for The Spectator, where you talked about this a little bit. And maybe a way into thinking about your your whole project is to think about Notre Dame. You, you, um, you say in the article with Billy that 
in in ages past, if a, a great building had burned down or had been damaged or something like that, it would have been improved upon. It would have been fixed. It would have been, you know, it would have been restored with certain principles in mind of that of that era, but it would have been organic. It would have still been beautiful. It would have still been kind of authentic and kind of part of the 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 dignity and the stature of the building itself. Now you say in the interview, if that were to happen today, if the modernists were to have get their hands on on Notre Dame, they would really just ruin it. And so what's happened, I guess, is they're, they're going to try to keep it the status quo, more or less. And that's that's basically good news. But let me throw it back to you and just get your thoughts on this on this particular issue. But that shows the poverty of, of today's culture. This definitely the poverty of, of today's architects. You know, no cathedral or, or few classical buildings in general are look like they did when they were built. You know, hundreds of years ago, every generation added, refined, you know, and created a new whole. So the the, the Notre Dame that we see is a product of the nineteenth century. I forgot his name, but he's a very famous, you know, French architect, uh, and he remade it in the 1850s. So that's that's the Notre Dame that we see. And where I live in Sweden, most of our medieval uh, cathedrals and churches, they are not very medieval at all. They were also products of the 19th century, because then we got, you know, the the flair of national romanticism. So they looked at our, you know, our cathedrals and churches. Oh, they were built in 1200, but they don't look like that. So we make them, you know, <laughs> we, we fake it a bit, you know, we make them to look more medieval than they are. So every generation, you know, has, has, you know, worked with the built environment, but they did it in the same language, you know, the classical mm -hmm. traditions, the classical language. So they could refine buildings. They could add something to the buildings. Every generation added something. Uh, I heard that one of you were, were in Krakow, uh, you know, recently. So if you have, let's say that you have, you know, the main cathedral in, in, in Krakow, you know, the interiors, there are, you know, p different pieces. There are like hundreds of years between maybe the altar piece and then the... I don't know, so, some, some uh, altar there. Also, you know, mm -hmm. different parts of the church, there can be hundreds of years, but it fits like a, a whole, despite there are hundreds of years between the different alterations. So it's a very different mindset that the architect of the past, they when they added something, they always had in consideration in creating like a, a new whole. When a modernist like today adds something, the most important thing for him is you know his narcissist belief that he wants to be seen, so that's why every addition that he will make will stick out like a sore thumb, because the important thing is not that it looks good or that it fits, is that people can see that he did something with it. So it's a very different mindset of doing something good and doing something because me 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 me. So that's also, you know, a part of this modernist ideology. It has muted a bit over there. But today it's basically it's very much narcissism. You don't care if you do is good or bad. The most the only th attribute that you care about is that it's new somehow and that people can see that you did it. If it's invisible, if it's good and you people don't notice it, then you see it as a failure because then people won't see that you did something. Right. You say in the, uh, you, I think you and Billy back and forth say in the piece that, you know, it's like the best case scenario for one of these architects is that for about 10 years, people will say, oh, that's cool. And then, and then after 10 years, it, it won't be cool anymore. It'll look actually really dated and lame. And it, and it will, and it will have been a, a complete disaster. Well, that's the thing, you know, the only thing, the only positive attribute that people can say about when I speak of modernism, it's like more or less every building built after 1945. There are new classical buildings, but but let's say that 95% of everything built post-war is, is modernist. And the only positive attribute that people can say, you know, the general public, is that things can look cool. But mm -hmm. cool is like, you know, with fashion, like with everything, it ages very badly. Mm -hmm. So just try to make a cool building. It will, have, it will be cool for a very short, short while. And then it will just be embarrassing or ugly or, or strange. So uh, they have the whole, their whole mindset is wrong 
you know, how to interact with the built environment. Because it's more about them than the people they serve or, you know, whatever that they serve. They don't try to create, you know, a symphony. They try to create like a, a note that you just random press a, a, a button on the piano just to make a noise. You don't create about, you know, the whole symphony. It's just, you know, about, about uh, me, myself and I. So, mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to Notre Dame, well, we dodged a bullet. But had, you know, Notre Dame has burned many times in history. Uh, and if you take France, you know, northeastern France was ravaged by World War I. You no, know, it was the front line in the First World War. But after the war, you know, in both Belgium and northeastern France, they rebuilt everything perfectly. They made it even better than it was before. And you don't think so much about, you know, those parts. Um, but now we cannot, as I said, you know, we, we cannot add anything. We cannot add, we cannot add any value because the modernist ideology doesn't even recognize that there is something like beauty. Beauty for them is entirely subjective and it's also shallow. So they don't strive for beauty and they don't even think that it exists. So if you have that mindset, you, it's like you cannot even create something beautiful. You cannot create anything of value. And because they are not allowed to, uh, to use ornaments, they cannot even you know, add some kind of cultural expression to what they do. So it's just flat shapes. What they create is like different kinds of computer-generated strange shapes that has no value, you know, it, it expresses nothing. And it doesn't tell also what, what place we are in. A modernist skyscraper could be anywhere on the planet. You don't see if it's Chile, if it's uh, Bangkok, or if it's Stockholm, you know, you, you cannot tell. It's just a strange shape with some glass and steel. Mm -hmm. While traditional Chilean architecture or the one in Stockholm or the one in Bangkok, even if, you know, both, you know, Stockholm and, 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 and Chile, let's say Santiago, we belong to, you know, to the same culture sphere, but still you can see that this was built in Chile or in Santiago and this was built in Stockholm. So there is a local character to everything. With modernism, there is no local culture expression. There is neither beauty nor local culture expression. It's just, you know, very reductive architecture that you know reduces man to just a, a consumer or a machine that you know should be stored work consume there's mm -hmm. no culture difference there's no beauty in life everything's just a, a pure function and it's very you know sad way yeah. of thinking it's interesting that you know in the article you you use the word you know, the way you describe um, Notre Dame throughout the ages, uh, you use the word whole, the whole, an awful lot. Um, and you just, you just used particulars. Um, but it's, it seems to me that, you know, kind of what you're articulating is, is something, it's like the whole part relationship, the universal, the particular, um, the two always need to go together. Um, and taking our eyes off of the whole, which it seems like, you know, I, I come from more of a philosophy background. Um, it seems like so much of the problem with even modern philosophy is to is the belief that there is no whole, to transcendent whole to contemplate. But what's interesting, and people like Hansers von Balthasar articulate this, is that once that kind of uh, contemplation of the whole is, is um, in a way forbidden, the particular vanishes as well. And so you just kind of have this flat, almost the sameness. Um, and, and, and it does, it does an injustice um, uh, to, to humanity uh, because, you know, you grow up in this ugliness and you, you just, it, it, it does not actually, like you said, it makes everybody miserable. But I, 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 I'd love to hear your thoughts on this a little bit more, because I, I really found that word whole interesting um, in your article. Yeah. Let's say when you walk a, a classical street in Prato, you don't think of all the beautiful buildings around you. And there can be hundreds of years between that they were built. You know, I talk about the classical architecture. 
-hmm. but you don't notice it because it no matter that there are 10 different classical styles on a street they form a whole they form a symphony they are in harmony with each other so nothing sticks out so they are just a beautiful backdrop to life you don't think so much about them it's like unconscious you just walk you stroll and maybe you stop and then you observe one of the particular buildings, you know, oh, how beautiful, how many details there are. But mostly we don't think about the beauty of classical architecture. It's just you know, part of the surrounding, like a beautiful backdrop to life. So, so that's, you know, it doesn't, you know, attack us, attack us. It, it just, it's there, it's harmony. It creates harmony. When you have like a, when you walk in a street and there's many classical buildings and then in the middle it's a modernist building, it sticks out. It destroys the whole. So it's not about you know how old the buildings are, but you know that that you think the architect thought that you know when I create, I create a part of a whole. So even if my building is in Art Nouveau style and the buildings left and right are in uh, uh, Renaissance, new renaissance style it doesn't matter because i make my building fit in volume in scale i make it you know i humble it down so despite that it's different from the other buildings it creates a new hole it's still part of the street so yes if you stop by you can look and admire it individually or like 95 percent people you just stroll by and it's just enjoyable and you don't really know why. You you can't really put the finger on why, it's just nice. Mm -hmm. So so that's you know, we consume architecture mostly unconscious. We walk with our feet, you could say, mm -hmm. um, where we want to be. And you don't put so much active thought, you know, mo most people can't define why we like it. We just do. I, I can help you to define why we like it, but but <laughs> In general, you know, just, just trust your senses. And there is a reason why people go to Krakow and Venice and Paris, because it's beautiful. They don't, it don't, doesn't need an explanation why it's beautiful. It's just something as we, as biological, yes, you can, you, we, can, we can, God is, you know, the, the absolute truth, but it's very hard to use God, unfortunately, in a modern argument. But as biological creatures, it just, you know, it just aligns with us, the classical. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, um, it's just interesting, too. Like, you know, you, 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 you mentioned this is something people intuitively like. And no matter what the, in some ways, purpose of the, if it's going to be a shop, a grocery store, an office building, a house. I mean, Roger Scruton has this great uh, documentary. Um, uh, what's it called, Andrew? Is it the Why Beauty Matters? Or, um, yeah. anyways, and he has this section. I think we've talked about this before in the podcast, where um, he talks about his ugly um, the, the town in which he grew up, um, the part of London, which just he sort of handed over to the barbarians. But yet there was this little little um, cafe uh, that has some humanity, and it was kind of a classical. Um, um, classical architecture building. And he says, no matter what the use of this building is, people want to be here. Um, and I find that in Krakow, you know, I, I'm, um, I teach in Krakow and every day I walk the streets uh, and I see a shop close down and a new one open up. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it fits. Um, whereas the modernist architecture, I grew up in Chicago and when you have like the big skyscraper. I mean, once that thing's empty, no, oftentimes, unless somebody's going, another corporation's going to fill it, nobody wants to be there. Um, no. So, you know, we, we can, you know, we, we can, the, the thing with traditional architecture and classical architecture is that it's the most modern of architecture because you touched something very important now. You know, we, we talk, we, it's a very popular now to talk you know, about climate change and ecology and, and such things. And I agree, it's important subjects. So what is the most climate friendly building? That's a building that we want to repurpose when the original function is not valid. 
you know, so if you have a classical building, because it's beautiful and because it has cultural expression, every generation tries to find a new purpose for it. So, of course, we destroyed a lot of buildings in the 60s and 70s out of ideological reasons, uh, because, you know, the progress, you know, the way they're thinking that they had then. But everyone agrees that it was a mistake. And why was it a mistake? Because these buildings were beautiful and had cultural expression. So what happens today? Old factory buildings, old warehouses, old mills are repurposed to luxury living and, and, and luxury hotels now all over Europe and probably in the United States as well. Would anyone consider to make a 1960s factory, a 1960s mill to choose to, to something new purpose? No, it would be torn down. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, these old utility buildings of the past are so beautiful and so expressive that we want to reuse them. Okay, we don't need the, the 19th century gas power plant. So let's remake it to something else because it has value beyond mere function. That's an ecological building. That's a climate smart building. Modernists have, you know, have completely misunderstood it. They think if we build it in ecological materials, then it will be an ecological building. No, it will not. Because if you build an ugly building, when the original use is no longer valid, you know, if if it's no longer a hotel or no longer a library, it will be torn down. Why will it be torn down? Well, because no one will protest when it's torn down. Developers, and I have nothing against developers, I have nothing against that they want to profit maximize. That has always been the case. But they will meet no resistance when they want to tear down a 1960s or 1980s building. No one will care. No one will engage that this glass box or this, this you know, strange uh, concrete building will be torn down. No one will protest. But if they will try to tear down a beautiful classical buildings, people will engage. They will try to stop it. Sometimes, of course, they fail and this building will be torn down. But in general, classical buildings have longer lifespans because people care about them. And that's climate smart. So you have the more to build classical and traditional is the most sustainable way of building, because that's buildings that will be keep, that will last for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And as you said in Krakow, okay, that thing closed down, so someone will open something else in that. It's like, it's just an eternal life cycle. And yes, maybe there need to be some adaptions. Well, buildings have been adapted through the centuries, and yes, okay, you make a little changes here, a little changes there. Okay, now it's a, now it's a hotel. Yesterday it was an office. Before that, it was a residential building, and in the future, it may be a residential building again. You know, it's like an eternal cycle of change. But the building will be there, and every generation we just add something. Yeah, you know, there uh, on the internet, you'll sometimes encounter. Um, you'll encounter funny memes or pictures or something where people will show a picture of a prison, for example, from the 19th century. That's very beautiful, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or whatever it may be. Right. Um, and, and nowadays, even the things that are meant to be beautiful are, are actually very ugly. I, I saw you, Michael, in a different interview I, I watched uh, online, you said something about how uh, for you in Sweden, um, the narrative is that, you know, Sweden used to be once upon a time was a poor country and is now a very wealthy country. But if you look at the things you used to build in Sweden, you you actually would think you were richer then than you are now. And I think the same thing in America. I mean, it's just grow, grow, grow. But what are we what are we doing with it? You know, we're just building these temporary things that nobody really cares about. Yeah. So, so what will last? What, what can we show? You know, in 200 years, all these mm -hmm. buildings that we build today, all these modern buildings, no one will be left. Either they will yeah. replace classical buildings that will last, or there will be new modernist buildings that in turn will be torn down in 30 years. So it's like a, it's like a, nothing will be spared. Nothing will, there will not be even ruins, you know, after, after, you know, after what we have done. And that, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. and I really want to tell about Sweden because, you know, Sweden is a, a Nordic country, cold country, always had a very, very small population. But even then, you know, in, in, in the year 1900, where there were 5 million people in the entire country, in the inland, northern, northern Sweden, you know, close to the Arctic Circle, in the inland, where it's minus 30 in the winter and it's uh, two meters snow, we have amazing public buildings. 
public schools, uh, government buildings, churches, everything that was built in the past. And, and you know, the population of these towns were maybe two or 3,000 people. But still, we could build these amazing public buildings. And, you know, the ordinary wooden buildings for, for ordinary people were also very, very beautiful. And then you look, you know, what we created post-war years, you know, the record years when Sweden became one of the richest. I think in the 70s, Sweden was like the fourth richest country in the world. And w- what architectural legacy have we had when, it, when we were the fourth richest country in the world? The most horrific, ugly buildings you can imagine. Okay, you, you probably have the same in the States, but, but you know, it, it's really a horror show. So, so you, you can't get, you know, this was one of the reasons why I started this, this whole movement that has become now, uh, because this cognitive, you know, I couldn't get it, you know, as a young teenager, how come they tell us in school that we were so poor and all the old buildings are so grandiose and mm-hmm. we, we don't speak about, you know, upper class building. We speak about working class districts in, in Stockholm where I grew up. And that's also the funny thing. All working class districts in Stockholm are inhabited by upper middle class today. There are no workers mm-hmm. or to live in the former working class districts. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so how come that they could build this for workers a hundred years ago? But today, even for the upper middle class, we just build total ugly crap. <laughs> and I really yeah. feel ugly crap. And we fill it with uh, furniture from your your uh, your native country's IKEA store. Yeah, right? yeah, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you know there there there, there, are, there are some exports. I, I okay IKEA I, IKEA I I furnished a lot with IKEA, but also when sure. I was young. It, yeah. It's when your first furniture is very good to have it from IKEA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm less proud of it. <laughs> so, so. You, you, you know, Andrew, speaking of memes, you know, I, I oftentimes saw this meme where you have um, on one side, you have a house that was built by, um, you know, some yeah, peasant yeah. that it is just beautiful. Um, people are, you know, like driving all over Poland to come see this little house. Um, and then you have a house designed by, uh, by an architect with a PhD. Um, so-called expert, and it's like nobody wants to be there. You know, there's there's a famous book that I read called Thomas by Tom Wolf called From Bauhaus to Our House, and it always like shocks me uh, that people would want to live in these kind of glass cubes. And he explains this, the history of this, and it's 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 kind of a popularized version of the history. But going from Gropius and the Bauhaus school um, all the way to you know today in Chicago when you have like Mises van der Rohe has all the, the, the great, uh, um, what was it? The city, um, the center and these, uh, the, my grandpa used to teach at the Illinois Institute of Technology um, and people uphold these things in Chicago sometimes, but I always feel like there's a little bit of a, like um, awkwardness in which they're upholding it. They're not quite sure if it truly is, is beautiful, no, no. but it's interesting. Can you explain yeah. some of that? Yeah. Yes, I can. Um, the thing is that you sell identity. So the modernists are snake oil salesmen. You sell progress. You know, a certain demographic, a certain part of the population wants to be seen as progressive and foresighting and everything. So what the modernists did is that they sell that you are the most modern if you live like this. And people buy it. And then they, after a while, they find out, oh, this wasn't so good. But, you know, there's very interesting, you know, there there are documentaries from from Sweden from the 60s. You know, BBC uh, came to Sweden, like, visit our first, you know, uh, concrete suburbs. Like, this is the living of the future. And people were, of course, very proud. You know, they moved out from, 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 yes, they're beautiful, but quite unmodern apartments in the city center to this concrete suburbs and they had you know uh, tap water and they had electricity and everything so it was became part of the identity we are modern now but it took only like a few years and then it's, this is really bad you know this this is not this is not a human environment yes we have you know all our our needs you know how to say the basic needs but it's socially dead this environment and it's so you know soulless so then they started to moving out so already after a few years 
all these so-called so modern modern apartments, they moved out. But mm. this continues. So every time they, they sell these glass boxes as the most progressive and modern thing, so they sell an identity to people. And some people want to believe that very much. But there's a lot of hypocrisy in this, you know. They say that they like this, but they live classical. Like, like most architects, I would say, as well. That, that is very funny, you know. They made a study, you know, where, where Swedish architects live. You know, 99% of Swedish architects are modernists. We have four classical architects in the entire country. So they made a study. The magazine for architects in Sweden made a study. Where do Swedish architects live? 12% of our housing stock is from be before 1930. But 27% of all Swedish architects live in this classical housing stock. So they have a higher preference than the populace <laughs> in general to live, you know, they, they, are, they will go to stretch, you know, use their money. They are not a high, high paid group to live in classical buildings, while at the same time they build modernists for everyone else. Mm. And this is not unique for them. You know, there are many examples. There are many, many of the famous architects, you know, that, that design modernists for everyone else. And then when you check where they live and where they work, is usually a classical building. So, so it's like lip service. If you want to be seen as progressive, you like this kind of architecture in theory. Not to live in, but you say that you like it. You like mm -hmm. it as a coffee book on your, on your, you know, uh, on your table. <laughs> not, you know, to, to, to live in. So yeah, they, they sell identity. That's why people say that they like this. It's a very few percentage that they really, really like. Of course, you know, there is human diversity. But every study that there is, when they ask people, and they have done many studies now, three quarters prefer traditional architecture and one quarter prefer modernist architecture. So mm. that, that's kind of, and they made, you know, I think the, uh, in the US it was, um, what you call it, uh, there was this institute that made a research, you know, what, what kind of you know, federal buildings, you know, you, you had this talk about Donald Trump, you know, made this, make architecture beautiful again. He wanted, you know, federal buildings to be built uh, and you, uh, entirely in, in, in classical tradition. So they made a survey, what kind of, you know, which buildings do people like of the already built federal buildings. So they took examples from Washington, D.C., and they asked people, they had a thousand respondents, and every demographic, you know, no matter race, no matter, you know, because you measure race in the U.S., no matter race, no matter age, no matter gender, no matter political views, it was almost the same. Three quarters preferred the traditional buildings and only one quarter preferred, you know, the modernist buildings. Mm -hmm. But then if you would ask people, like more, you know, in a less subtle way you know if you ask them directly you will get different so it's it's how you formulate the question when they believe that no one notice they will give more you know more truthful answer when they believe you know it's about identity you know because modernists try to label classical architecture as some kind of right wing far right even nazi and most people maybe don't want to be seen as some kind of far-right Nazi or something, you know. So, so that's why they will in public say, oh, but I, I, I like both. Mm -hmm. But it is not that they don't. It's just, you know, so, so it's an identity thing. Um, yeah, and we have this weird disconnect in, in the United States anyway, too, where people will say that they prefer traditional buildings and they go on vacations to go see traditional buildings. They go to Europe, for example. But they just, for some reason, they don't, they don't think that's something to strive for for themselves in their own lives or in their own communities. They, they make do. They're, they're perfectly fine with the glass and steel on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's a strange disconnect because they, they express a preference for something else, but they just get on with whatever is provided. Uh, they believe that they are unique. Uh, you know, that modernists are, you know, it, it's more like a, 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 you could view them as, you know, some kind of experts in, in wielding power. So they have made people believe that it's only your individual taste. Most mm -hmm. people believe that there's a, a big, you know, mm -hmm. if you would ask people, how many people do you think prefer modernist architecture or how many people prefer, prefer classical architecture? They wouldn't say that, oh, uh, an overwhelming majority prefer classical. 
they would probably believe this. Maybe it's 50-50, I don't know, maybe 30, 70. Uh, you know, they, they would give different answers, but they would believe that ah, it's only my individual taste that I prefer classical. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to impose my personal, you know, beliefs on someone else. So then you have this indifference to the built environment. But the power of, of, you know, the advocacy that I do, and, and it's a movement called the Architecture Uprising uh, that exists in many European countries, some of them Poland, a very good uprising there, mm -hmm. um, is to make people realize that they are not alone in, in preferring classical architecture. They are the overwhelming majority. And then things happen. Then they are there to be more outspoken when they realize that they are not, it's just that their subjective tastes it's a taste of the overwhelming majority. So, so everything is very much, you know, it's very much about identity, psychology. We vote with our feet, of course. We vacate in all these beautiful places. But, you know, how we act then, we are group creatures. So we will act according to how we believe that society works and, mm -hmm. and what everyone else thinks. We, we adapt ourselves to the environment of the world that yeah. we believe is... Yeah, I want I want to get it into uh, actually your um, your your website here on the new traditional architecture. Um, there's so many good um, you know links that you provide and information about how this actual revival um, is taking place around not only in the United States but in Europe and around the world. Um, so I want to I want to point uh, people to the the newtrad.org website. Um, that you run uh, because it's it's just fascinating. I was going through it um, um, yesterday and I was looking at uh, particularly the atlas of new uh, traditional architecture and then also um, looking at education in classical architecture and urbanism. Um, for a while there, I was really interested in the new urbanist movement um, because I, um, I actually went with the talk. I have a, I have a friend uh, who's an ecclesiastical art historian, and he brought me to this talk um, in Chicago uh, by one of these new urbanists. Um, and I actually, his name is, I think, Andreas, um, um, I, oh, I'm forgetting his name, but he and his wife were I some. Well, I forgot what was his name, but I think I know when you. Yes. Um, they, 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 did, um, they did actually the, um, the famous. Um, the famous city or the town that's featured in the Truman Show. Um, what's it called? It's seaside. Oh, well, Seaside. Seaside. Yes. Is it Seaside in Florida? Or? It's Seaside in Florida. Yeah. Um, but you know, what's interesting is I think there's there's better. They're striving for something. Um, and I, you mentioned the Notre Dame Architectural School, and you know, um, Andrew and I were talking about. We I know this uh, guy Philip Bass who does a lot of this stuff. Um, and they're kind of missing, what I'm talking about is the new urbanists, they're kind of missing, I think, a, more, a robust uh, foundation to ar better articulate like what you're actually doing with using language like the whole um, to uh, articulate actually what it means to be a human being and to live a fully, uh, fully flourishing life in a city that just, that is conducive to that. So your your website, I have to say, is is just such a great resource. Can you can you tell us a little bit about how you started this uh, newtrad.org website, and then a little bit about also the the atlas and how do you get that information? First of all, if I could, if I was a native English speaker, I could express my ideas much better in English. Unfortunately, my, my native language is Swedish, so it's it's a second language. So, so it's always I always fault a bit with words. But um, the, the thing is, paradigm shifts always come from people outside the field. If maybe it shocks people, but my main interest is not architecture or city planning. <laughs> my main interest is sociology and social anthropology. Please ask me about different tribes in Papua New Guinea, and I can gladly speak about that for mm -hmm. hours. So, so uh, and you know, in Poland is very interesting, also, you know, because Poland, yes, because you mentioned Krakow, you know. So, I, you know, when I when I visit, you know, cities in Poland and Lithuania, I always try to find, you know, all the different, you know, Greek Catholics is very exciting because I read a lot about the history of Poland. So the 
how to say, I, I see things very, very differently. But mostly, I, you know, I look through, through a social anthropological eye. But because I'm not an architect, so I try to analyze things in a different way than an architect would do it, you know. Um, so basically, uh, I had this, as I mentioned, as a, already as a teen, you know, you notice that it's so strange. We are told that we were so poor, but then we got rich. But if you look at architecture, it's, it's very different. Uh, and I cannot draw. My, my mother was very good at drawing. I have a sister that is very good at drawing as well. I cannot draw. So I couldn't become the architect I would be, could like to become, a classical architect. So, so I studied society planning then, uh, because there is no uh, jobs in social anthropology in Sweden, at least. You get unemployed, basically, if you study that subject. Um, and I studied this, and I still wanted to make some kind of, you know, change, because it was so strange. You know, I, I never met anyone that liked modernist architecture. And still, that's the only thing built. And if you look at the magazines, you can you cannot find a beautiful new building. They only highlight ugly and strange buildings. So, luckily, in a way, social media came. You know, Facebook was created in 2007. Uh, I wasn't so impressed by Facebook in the beginning, but because Facebook in 2007 was like Instagram today. People post photos of themselves at the beach. You see their feet and, and their food, what they ate to breakfast. And it's like, God, you know, what is this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> there are very funny memes about that, you know, or what people will do in the future, you know. Uh, and someone travels back and tells people in the 60s about Facebook. And it's like, is everyone retarded in the future? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, but jo jokes aside, you know, I, I'm human also, so of course you, you want to show your life and show it in a perfect way. But basically, mm -hmm. Facebook matured after a few years, so it became many interesting groups of different interests. So I thought then, you know, okay, I want to make an impact, and I thought, you know, in a sociological way, I want Swedes, because Swedes are... Their identity is mainly that they want to be seen as the most modern and most progressive. That's a part of the Swedish national modern identity of Swedes is that they want to be seen as the most progressive and most forward looking. So I created a Facebook group with a Swedish name that you could say the, the equivalent in English is new traditional architecture. Uh, and the goal was to show not in theory should be beautiful, but to show actual built projects. Because I wanted to cut short all the discussion. No, it's too expensive. Uh, there are not craftsmen. Uh, there are regulations hindrance. If you show practical built examples, then everything must have been solved. You know, the economy must have been solved. No developer builds things out of altruism. They build it to make profit. So it was profitable to build this classical building. And they were craftsmen because they built this classical building. It exists, so therefore they were craftsmen. And it wouldn't be allowed if it didn't follow our modern regulations. So then, you know, it's like, a, how do you say, call it an Alexander cut for the Gordian knot. You don't need to discuss all trivialities. You, you can, if you show a practical example, this was built, then you move forward. And then because it was a Swedish audience, I had to show projects from two cities that Swedes think are the most progressive and forward-looking in the world, and that is Berlin and New York. So if you show for Swedes, like they build classical, new classical in Berlin and New York, then it must be the most modern thing to do. So that was, you know, the trick to, to <laughs> learn a Swedish audience to do this. So, of course, people like classical, but they want, at the same time, they don't, as you told you, it's about identity project. They don't want to be seen as backward. But if they do it in Berlin and New York, then this must be the coolest and hippest thing you can do. So from that group, I, you know, I'm not talented. I wasn't, you know, I didn't study marketing or anything like that. But from that group, uh, a member that didn't study marketing that much either, he started a group that, if you translate it to English, is called Architecture Uprising. But he didn't, he didn't want to be public. So I became the public face for that. And these two groups worked as two legs on the same body. One showed projects from all over the world. And the architecture uprising was more about creating public interest. Because people have been conditioned to be indifferent 
regarding architecture, because everyone believes that there's a rational reason for all the ugliness. It must be costs. If you would ask a random guy, why are everything so ugly in the modern world? Oh, it must be costs. But when you show them that it's not about cost, you can build like this, and it's not more expensive. We have all the talent that we need. Everything we need is to choose to build like this. Then, you know, the magic happens. Then people get interested in architecture. Now, when I say people, I mean, you know, non-architects. 99% of people don't have architecture as a main interest. But the strength with this uprising that we also have created, that you can find links, and I can provide you links, because it, now it has spread all over Europe, and there is even two chapters in the States, um, is that they engage people that don't have architecture as a main interest. So this has really grown, uh, and they have walked, you know, side by side. And in 2018, I switched the, my Swedish group to English to reach an international audience, because, you know, English is the modern lingua franca, and, and to cross the language barrier as well. Because, uh, as we discussed earlier, people are also atomized that everyone believes it's just my individual taste. And also, Europe, there are so many languages in Europe, so people don't know what happens in their neighboring country. So Poles have no idea what's built classical in Germany, and Germans have no idea what's built classical in Poland. So to introduce everyone what's happening in the neighboring country. And that's also psychology. Because, you know, if Germans can build this, then we must be able to build this in Sweden. They can't be better than us. And it's the same thing, you know, if, if, if Poles can build it, then Czechs have to build it, because they can be better than us. You know, every, every country has its neighboring country that they want to be at least as good as. You know, if they, those backward uh, Slovakians can build it, then we Hungarians will definitely be able to build it. So, so it's also, you know, a part of showing what your neighbors do and connect people, you know, over language barriers. So th this is what, you know, new traditionalists have evolved to. Uh, how do I find all projects? Well, there you come, my, my strength in social anthropology, because I know, you know, general history and culture of, like, every country in the world. Okay, now I brag a bit. Uh, then you just use Google Translate, and you know what to search for, and then you find out, and then you create this public database, and then you get to know, because I'm passionate about it. I, I learn it also by memory what happens, you know, in different countries. And then I write about it so that everyone can, you know, get to know, so that we don't know things that we are, you know, individual islands. This happens only in Poland. This happens only in the States. or this happens only in France. No, it happens everywhere. And people everywhere, you know, we are all humans. So people everywhere prefer traditional architecture. And it's not a European thing or an American thing. It's in... Asia, you know, people in China have the same preference as we. They prefer traditional architecture to modernist architecture. But in the developing countries, they are like we were in the 60s. They have been sold this lie of progress that in order to be modern, it has to be this, you know, high rises and skyscrapers. But do they like it? No, they hate it. How do mm -hmm. I know it? Well, have you seen, you know, fertility rates in East Asia? It's total crash. You know, every generation is like a quarter of, you know, the previous one. So they have clearly created total dystopias because people don't want to bring children to the world. So mm -hmm. it's a lie that has been sold, you know, to the developed world that this is what progress looks like. You know, these glass high rises. And they suffer the most of it because their cities have grown, you know, now. In the US and, and maybe even more in Europe, the cities grew big during the 19th century. So we have a lot of old stock. If you take, you know, cities in the developing countries, they were very, very tiny until very recently. So 95% of their built environment is built post World War II. And it looks thereafter, it looks horrific. And they somehow they, they tell to themselves that this is progress. But it's not. And people don't like it. It's not, you know, you have atomized people. And that's, you know, what we see in, in South Korea and, and China, that uh, previously they lived in, in 
I, I butcher foreign language name, but Hutong was their, their quarter block structure that they had in Chinese cities. They butchered that, you know, from architecture that created community where no one was alone. There were always, you know, helping, helping hands and eyes. No one, you know, no old single man was left to, to starve or die. No child was, you know, they could run wild because there was always eyes, watchful eyes. Two people put in 40-story high-rises when no one knows anyone. So, so it's, yeah. you know, architecture of loneliness, really. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, sorry to cut you off. I, I want I want to draw just um, so that our listeners don't miss this um bobby brought up the your the atlas that you have the atlas of new traditional architecture and, and i know you're probably coming to that a little bit more but i just want to highlight something maybe you can comment further the thing that i love about this atlas that you've created and it's wonderful it's interactive and we're definitely going to point our listeners and our viewers to this so that they can explore it for themselves but i love how you have different different icons on the map that represent different types of buildings, like a cross for a church and a, a little uh, uh, tower for a castle or like whatever it may be. But the thing that I like so much about it is what you've collected here is not just churches and castles and things like that. It's exactly what you were talking about before. You know, I clicked on some of them and it's just a just an ordinary building on a street or an ordinary home or something like that, but it's beautiful. It's well, it's well constructed. And it's the kind of thing, which as you said before, kind of blends in, but in a good way. Uh, so I just, you know, maybe you could comment on that, just that you're not just collecting famous new buildings or things that are like, you know, controversial or making a splash, but just these, you know, all kinds of things that are just bit by bit, you know, maybe giving hope for something different. Well, that's the classical mindset, the whole, not, not like this iconic building. 95% 99% of building, I, I use this 95, 99% very much, but, but it, it's true in architecture. Ma, the overwhelming majority of buildings are not meant to be focal points or iconic buildings. It used to be in the classical city, and maybe you, you have it in Washington at least, you have height restrictions. The only mm -hmm. buildings that rise above are the public and the religious building. And that's also, you know, about ideas. What is important in society? The religious, the spiritual, and the public. And the rest of the buildings are maximum six, uh, some are seven stories, but generally maximum six stories in most European cities. Um, so, so it's, it's uh, how to say, a general environment where you consider the whole. It's not a specific building. It's a mindset how you create air, all architecture. And not only architecture, the pavements, the materials that we use for roads. You know what a difference it is to have, you know, okay, you can make cobblestones can be a pain to walk on. So, but you can make them very, very precise today so that they are totally flat, but you still have the visual beauty of it. Um, so it's such a difference if you have uh, beautiful lampposts and beautiful pavement, uh, beautiful signing, like, how, how do you say, one thing that, that ruins a lot of, you know, beautiful classical buildings today is that they have these horrible modern signs instead of beautiful classical signs. So it's, it's a, how do you say, a, a holistic view of our total built environment. Everything should be beautiful because everything is connected. And beauty is nothing shallow. Beauty shows, you know, we are refined people. We have values that we want to express with this refinement. And if you should have a pure, like, utilitarian view of things, it makes us happier and healthier to live in a beautiful environment and live in, in an ugly environment. So you can have so many, you know, functional arguments why, why beauty is such an important function so yeah th that's why i want to highlight all all the general buildings all kind of buildings Resi most uh, dots on the atlas are residential buildings they can be both individual homes and it can be you know apartment buildings mm -hmm. um, so, so it's it, it's every type of architecture and the atlas is is not complete there, there are so many buildings that lack but you know it's 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 time-consuming uh, 
it's quite time i get help from it you know so so i write the contributors of this atlas but maybe i added 70 percent of our buildings in the in the atlas uh, it is very time consuming but i try to add as much as i can what is good and it's also color coded so you have three different colors of all the buildings when you watch red is general quality not great not terrible uh blue light blue is very good quality and then you have dark blue and that's excellent hmm. you have a few really excellent buildings in the states you know each country has, has different strengths when it comes to to this this movement of new classical architecture in america you have amazing new classical buildings but most of them are in lousy urban settings. So you have this amazing new opera house and it's surrounded by surface parking in some suburb. So, so it, how do you say, <laughs> it, it loses part of, of, of it, it's, uh, how do you say, it would be so much better if you put it in a nice urban setting. In Europe, we have the opposite problem. We have in general, much more mediocre classical buildings, but they have them in amazing urban settings. So if we could marry, you know, American excellence with European urbanism, that would be, really something but but you know we're getting everyone need to learn from each other just just to know what's happening you know, in different countries so color coding and yes icons also you know what type of building and as you notice on the atlas it's not only europe and north america we have latin america we had a, a brazilian that added so many projects in latin america we have buildings in africa and we have buildings in asia we would have more, even more buildings in Asia if we had more, we had more people that knew the different Asian languages. We have uh, one Filipino guy that helps us to add things in the Philippines and some East Asia countries. But in general, there's probably much more built in, in Japan and Vietnam that we don't know of, that we of course would like to add. And everyone can help with this atlas. If, if you are serious, just contact me and, and you can become you know, co-editor as long as you want, of course. There's no mm -hmm. pressure. And you can add projects to this atlas. And, and you know, it's like a crowd, crowd uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then you can use it. And, and this atlas, so I, I talk so much all the time. Um, this atlas is, you know, useful for two things. One is, of course, for discovery. You know, when you're tourist, you can visit new classical buildings. But it's also very useful for research. Why? Because what you notice with that is that there are clusters, clusters of new traditional buildings. A cluster indicates that there are favorable conditions for building classical. So then you try to find out why, let's say, the, the commune surrounding central Paris, why is there so much classical built there? So you try to find out why. And the reason for that is political, because the mayors there are very, very pro classical, so they see to it that it's built. So each cluster can indicate something. It can be, you know, that there are many classical firms, there can be political support, there can be public support, but then there is a reason, there is something that you can learn how to create a good environment for new traditional architecture. So yeah, it's... This, uh, is, this, is, this is great. Um, you know, um, I, I wish that I found this in high school because um like you it didn't, I was, it didn't exist back then bobby it did, i mean yeah but it's it's interesting how this though uh revival of classical architecture is kind of a recent phenomenon um you know i was i was reading about some of the you know most famous architecture schools in america like yale school of architecture but then you had somebody like um Pearl westfall at notre dame and how notre dame actually went the classical route but there's been actually in recent, like the last maybe two decades and even maybe more recently been an explosion of this. And I, most of my friends- Lost um, five years, lost five years. Yeah, yeah, most of my, and I was talking, you know, I was talking to Gene Diamond, uh, Andrew knows him mm -hmm. um, as well. And we both were saying, man, if we had to go back to school, we would love to kind of go this route. Um, but it just seems to me, you know, that so much you you've been articulating this that as human beings we're meant to give birth to the beautiful and that that is in having children that's in having 
actually building beautiful things. Like right now, um, I, I have a, the week off and my father-in-law and mother-in-law nicely came down and my um, my he's helping me build, uh, or actually he's the one mainly building it because he's a welder, um, but he's building, we're building a shed. And what's the thing that is so satisfying about this work is that, you know, he's, he, he, he's as a welder, he's doing this. And then I see him take a, a step back and, you know, he just, he's a very expressive Polish man. And he's just like, ah, okay, good, good. And, you know, I'm painting everything and then we're putting it together. But I was like thinking in preparation for this interview, I was thinking, man, this is just what we're made to do. We're made to build these things that we are like, you know, we want to contemplate. And then I can't wait because my dad's coming in a couple of weeks to show him you know, hey, we did this. And, now we, and, and so, yeah, so, so I mean, it just all in some ways, like you said, the, the birth rates are even declining. And if some people may think, oh my gosh, how can you link that to architecture? But to me, it just all goes together. Um, so so I'm, I'm so happy that you're making this, these points. And now we have this, you know, somewhere in the last, uh, seeing how this is actually something other people are recognizing as well. I, I, I warn you that I'm a bulldozer and I interrupt, but I have to because mm -hmm. there, has, there is so many fields to cover and you touched something very good now because now there are so many threats to this survival and we have to fight them all the time. One is now, you mentioned something, work with your hands. That's the magic, you know, that we want craftsmen back. And it's so important with craftsmen because it connects us to our built environment. It's not the same thing, you know, there is, there is a guy in New York that develops a, a robot now that you know it can create all this marvelous uh, stone work and everything but that alienates us that makes us consume beauty that is just aware you know the magic is that a craftsman the, the magic of florence or krakow is that you know people made this with our hands it's perfect imperfection you know it, it's it's like they have touched it's human hands that created, not some kind of robot. We have already been alienated from our food by moving to cities. So most people don't connect that, you know, the meat that you have on your plate is actually been a cow. So they get very scared, you know, they can be against slaughter, but at the same time they want to eat meat. And it's the same thing, you know, we have to do things with our hands because it connects us. It makes us prideful. And, you know, the work of the craftsman, even if I didn't do it, just knowing that someone did this with his hands is, you know, part of the magic. It, it's, you know, it refines us, as you, it lifts the human spirit. And a robot cannot replace that. A robot will just alienate us from the built environment as much as we alienate it from so many other things, you know, in the, in the human experience. So thank you for bringing it up and sorry for interrupting you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, no, that's all wonderful, Michael. And um, we, we've just about run out of time. So we'll have to pause our conversation perhaps there for another session in the future. But we are, we are so grateful for the time that you've been able to share with us. And we really hope that our listeners and viewers will check out your website, newtrad.org. And uh, consider us, Michael, fellow travelers with your, with your project. We're, we're very excited to see where this goes. Thank you very much for having me. And you are part of the change because yeah. now you know now th that's the thing now you know and you will talk to people and you will have a higher expectations and that's yeah. the thing how you change things so you are part of the solution i'm not an architect i've not built a single building in my life it just you know spreading this idea that we can build beautifully if we want and we should yeah amen to that our guest today has been michael diamond who is the founder of New Traditional Architecture. Um, Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. And to our listeners and viewers, uh, please do take the time to rate and review us. Give us that five-star review. Share this episode so that more people can learn about Michael's work and our work at the Space Salvi Institute. Check us out, spacesalviinstitute.com. We've got some great new articles up there, and we put all of our new podcasts up there as well. So until next time, God bless and live in hope.